Good afternoon. It is lovely to see the whole pack. I always enjoy coming to Student Pride. Great event. Um, one of the things I feel is there should be a conversation across the generations. Uh, history is identity. And the more oral history we can get about where we've come from, the battles that have been fought by others on our behalf, the better. And many of us love our parents, and we uh, have conversations with them, and we have parents who are as understanding and tolerant as they can be, but they don't know our history. But we are incredibly lucky this evening in this very special Queer AF podcast being broadcast here at Student Life, being recorded here at Student Life. We are very lucky to have someone who has lived through and fought through 50 years, more than 50 years, of the most staggering change in the social attitudes towards LGBT plus uh, communities. So we are really lucky and a big welcome to Ian McKellen. Ian. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Tell us your coming out story. It was, it, it, it was about 1988, I think, wasn't it? Was it, it you, you'd been open in theatre land, but you never felt you needed to make a public statement, and then you felt you had to say something. Hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> How lovely to be interviewed by you. I'd, I'd much rather ask you questions, but uh, oh, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Um, it, I suppose looking back, the <laughs> there was silence, you see, absolute silence. If you began to think that, um, you, as I did, that I was attracted to men and people of my own age, uh, there was no one, absolutely no one to talk to about it. There was nothing that I knew to read. There were no gay publications. There were not in Bolton, uh, there may not be today, uh, any gay um, social places where you could um, reliably meet people. The only indication that you got that you were not alone was on the rather nasty uh, drawings of genitalia in the public uh, lavatories <laughs> with telephone numbers or meet me here at 7.30. Um, <laughs> but you couldn't be sure what day they were talking about. That, there was nothing, of course, at school, nothing, of course, at church, nothing, of course, at my home. Although I think I had a gay cousin, but he was, he was married. Uh, so that was just an... So there was nothing. There were... There were and, and, and being silenced, I didn't speak. I, I wasn't a, re a rebel at all. I just thought, well, this is the way I am, and this is... Um, but I don't know what to do about it. So I didn't do anything about it. It, it took me till... Uh, my third year uh, at university to uh, have anything that I could call proper sex. Uh, and even then, it, uh, the world didn't really change because I didn't tell anybody about it. Uh, and seriously, one of the reasons I became a professional actor was that I'd heard that you could meet queers uh, in the British theatre. <laughs> and my dears, it's quite true that you can. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, in my first week of being a professional actor, I, I became uh, more open, uh, and I, I, I fell for uh, a much, much older man in, in the company of actors in Coventry. I was 22, and he was very nearly 27. <laughs> and, uh, but even after that, for another couple of decades, uh, gay liberation passed me by. 
It wasn't a proselytizing organization. And even being in Bent, Martin Sherman's sensational play, which educated the world about uh, the ill treatment of gay people in, under the Third Reich in the labor camps, uh, um, I was saying to the press, oh, this is not a play about, um, <laughs> about gay rights, it's about human rights. Well, of course it is, but it also it is not. And I didn't get any pressure from anybody to say, uh, come out and be yourself, because I was being quite happy, uh, living openly with a, a, te a history teacher uh, uh, in, uh, in our flat. We had gay friends, straight friends. We went out together, always as a couple, Brian and I. But of course, we never held hands. It was kind of don't ask, don't tell, actually, wasn't it? You what? Don't ask, don't tell, just... Yeah, but nobody was asking. Yeah, no. And, and <laughs> not, not, not even the press interviewing no, no. Uh, a man in his um, late 30s who wasn't married. They, they didn't say, are, are you looking for a... Are you hoping to get married one day? Have you got a girlfriend? Those questions were not asked because it was the worst thing you could possibly say about somebody in, pub, in, in, in print, that they were gay. And Simon Callow... Uh, there should be a statue to Simon Callow. He was the first, uh, as far as I know, openly gay actor in this country because he, he'd grown up gay. He was gay at university. Uh, and, and when he became an actor, he was gay too. And he talked about it in, in the press. And the press would not report it. They wouldn't <laughs> mention it because they thought he didn't know what was good for him. Uh, and so he had to write a book to come out. You see, strange, strange days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, you did come out, and it was yes. around the time of Section 28, yes. and that was, so we're late 80s, Thatcher government takes this measure, now very, very widely seen as a, as a terrible, terrible uh, yeah. piece of legislation that effectively bans the promotion of homosexuality, but is singling out a particular group in a piece of legislation, and you, that was your kind of political awakening. Oh, to say, to totally. Yeah. Uh, uh, a lesbian friend of mine uh, gave me uh, some information about Section 28, which I was ignorant of, uh, and I immediately wanted to join in the fight that had started. Uh, and uh, I found it very, very easy to, to be indignant and, and to awaken in myself something that should have been stirred up years before. Uh, and uh, in the course of a, a radio interview about Section 28 with, with, with one Peregrine Worsthorn, you don't know him, do you? But rather right wing. I, I, I think he was the editor of the Daily Telegraph, Telegraph I think, for a time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and he was anti Section 28. Pro Although it's on record, he had sex with George Melly at school, so I don't know what, he was, what the problem was. <laughs> He'd obviously had an easier time of it than I had. Uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> We, we, we argued on, on, on the radio, and, and eventually I said, oh, will you stop talking about them? You're talking about me. Uh, I'm, uh, and I think I said, I'm uh, homosexual. I, I hadn't quite got round to using the word gay. Yeah. <laughs> Let alone queer. Well, that was no, a, queer. That's much well, <laughs> queer was not a word we liked no, to use no, about ourselves no, no. because it was a word that was used about us. Yeah. Uh, we hadn't realized that if we could grab that word and keep it for ourselves, then... Uh, uh, that would be a good idea. But that was a real moment, that moment that on the radio, in that debate with Peregrine Worsthorn, that was Ian McKellen, Mark II, now he's serious. And yes, he's going and, to and the first thing I did before the broadcast went out live, uh, went out uh, two days later, was to go up to uh, s see my 80-year-old stepmother and tell her that I was gay. Oh, right. <laughs> At 48. And I was shaking and shivering and I stammering. Bet. And when I eventually said, Gladys, I'm trying to tell you that I'm gay, she said, oh, darling, I thought you were going to tell me something really dreadful. I've known that for 35 years. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Ian, is there, there's a story on the Wikipedia page about you. You can see I've really done my advanced research. There is a story <laughs> about you lobbying Michael Howard, who was then the Environment Secretary, yeah. who was taking this piece of legislation through government, he was the local government minister. Yeah, he, so he was environment was and local government. Yeah. And you go and see him, and I want you to tell the story. Don't make me tell the story. It's not true, the story that I'm It's not true. Say. No, not really. No. Anyway, uh, it was... Can you tell it anyway? Because I, I, it's so good. I'd, I'd, gotten, I'd got involved with, with, with 20 openly 
uh, gay or lesbian uh, people who, who started a, a lobby group, uh, which still exists, Stonewall. And, and uh, on their behalf, uh, I, I was sent out to, to, to talk to people. And, and being a bit famous, that, that they were rather flattered with the idea that I might, as I did, on a Sunday morning, go to Michael Howard's house, where I met his charming wife uh, and two daughters. Uh, and uh, I tried to persuade him that he was wrong, and I didn't succeed. And we'd had, we'd had a little bit of a pleasant uh, disagreement, and so feeling a bit disconsolate, I was shown the door, uh, but not before. He said, would you mind signing my uh, children's autograph albums? I said, are you sure they'll, they'll want a, a, a gay man in there? Oh, yes, that'll be fine. And, and I'm su supposed to have put in these autograph albums, fuck off. But <laughs> Of course I didn't. You didn't. No. You didn't. We must no, get that correct. No, we must no. get that correct. But, you know, Michael Howard has now apologised. Oh, good for him. Well done. But, you know... Uh, has he, he came to you and said, I think it was all a mistake. And he would... uh, well, well, now he said, yes, he, regret, yeah. he, regrets, he regrets the stance the he took. But yeah. he was doing it at the bidding of, uh, of Margaret Thatcher, who, uh, although she, she, she worked happily with um, gay people, uh, professionally, she, she didn't really understand that there was a need for them to yeah. um, join the human race. Interestingly, <laughs> you, you set up Stonewall, a big gang of you, you set up Stonewall, still going, uh, still going strong all those years later. Um, meanwhile, Peter Tatchell, who we were hearing from earlier, yeah. set up this thing called Outrage. Yes. There was a little bit, in those days, there was a bit of Rivalry, wasn't oh, there? Absolutely. You were the you were the suffragists, suffragists, and they were the suffragettes. You were the kind of peaceful wing. That's right. Talking to Michael Howard and not yeah. writing expletives in his kids' autograph book. They were the kind of the agit prop lot who were going out, sit-ins, humiliating the Archbishop of Canterbury and getting yeah. up and disrupting sermons and things like that. Yeah. Tell us about that, because was it a tension between you? Because in the end, I think it worked rather well for both of you that you had this kind of two two legs, if you Well, will. Peter has no bigger fan that, 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 than, than me, but uh, at the time, uh, he, he, he didn't really approve of what Stonewall was doing because we were not a democratic organization. We didn't have membership. We were a lobby group. We were self-appointed, uh, and, and uh, we thought the argument was pretty clear that we, 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 we wanted all the anti-gay laws to be uh, repealed. That was the aim. Uh, and with the exception of, uh, yes, I think it's been achieved, actually, in, in, in the UK. Uh, but Peter, I think, wanted to change the world. He thought being queer was uh, made one different, and, and there was a, there was a, a different view of society uh, to, to be imagined, and, and that uh, was something to be fought for in any way possible. We, we just went in our best suits into the offices and <laughs> made the case. And... Um, uh, Actually, what happened without us realizing it was that uh, the government, the, the, the establishment, felt they were being protected from the likes of uh, Peter uh, and others who could potentially be violent, I think was their fear, uh, because we were so respectable. So it was a very good partnership. It was a good cop-bad cop game, yeah. really, wasn't good it? Good cop-bad and, 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 and for the establishment, it, it, yeah. it worked, and they did come right. But I think, I think that's still true today, that you don't have to be in the big organisation to make it happen. There can be lots of organisations. And the idea that there's such a thing as the gay community, I've never fallen for at all. We're, we're not a community. There are lots of communities, yeah. I think. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to imagine that we're, we're all the same in our desires and everything else. It's amazing how far the world has come and the debates that are raging now on all sorts of things. Uh, I would bet, I mean, I struggle to keep up. I mean, we've got brown, black stripes and yes. I was listening to the debate about it earlier. I struggle to keep up. Do you struggle to keep up? With I, don't, kind of I, don't, I don't keep up. I just get on with my life and uh, <laughs> be, being me. I mean, that's all I've ever done. I've never been the leader. I've, I, I've carried the flag. <laughs> uh, but uh, I didn't design it, you know. I'm, mm. uh, so I'm, I'm just one of the troops, really. But in a way, I mean, you can have... I, I think it's wonderful that students at the vanguard of this debate these issues ad nauseam. Mm. Often, I think... Are you overthinking this a little bit? I mean, you know, do we, do we need to have this argument? Or, 
But the truth is, there's a principle which I think has more or less become accepted by most of society, not all, which is it's a principle about respect for people. Yeah. It's live and let live and live and let love, isn't it? Isn't yeah. that, you, that's what you have to live by at the end of it. Yeah. I, I saw Peter on, on the streaming today saying that uh, in the old days, it was not equality that we were after. Well, that always was Stonewall's uh, aim. We should be treated equally under the law. And I think uh, that has really been achieved. It's been achieved in this country, uh, I think, because we're a small country. You know, if you want change, it's all going to happen in this city. And you can bump into people. The, uh, uh, it, is, it is possible to meet the, the person who will make the decision at some gathering or other. And uh, in, in a way, that's just absolutely not possible in the United States, for example, where, which is a, a, a we're continent. We're, we're, a, we're a small country. Uh, and I think that's been a, a great benefit to us. Let's get personal, Ian. Oh. <laughs> these, are, these are younger people than you. Yes. I think they should get some benefit of your personal counselling and advice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, what would you write to your teenage self? Actually, you were teenage, your teenage years in the 50s are very, very different. What, what advice do you give young gay people who are thinking about life and relationships and sex? Well, my best friend at school, David Hargreaves, we went to the theater together. We, we did high kicks in the playground. We acted together. We were inseparable. And we were both gay. And I didn't know that about David until 25 years later. <laughs> you see, this silence. What I love about schools is that it is possible to think of a school as the world. Uh, within, that, within those walls, you can make a society. And, and it seems to me, whether they're private schools or public schools, whether they're uh, academies or, or, or whether long-standing uh, grammar school, ex-grammar schools, that the aim seems to be the same from, from the teachers to, to create within, within that a, 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 a safe place where whatever's happening at home, whatever's happening on the streets, whatever's happening in the public debate, in school you are safe uh, to be uh, yourself. And that goes for transgender uh, kids too. And uh, so far from giving them advice, I, 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 <laughs> I get a bit weepy. I say, oh, should we, we should have been like this when I was at school. Uh, where, because uh, of course, if you, if you're, if you can be yourself, if you can express yourself, if you can puzzle about yourself, if you can argue uh, and worry and, and, and try to understand yourself, you're going to be better at your studies, aren't you? You're going to be better as a child uh, at, at home. You're going to be better as a lover. You're going to be better in every possible way. So th I think that would be... Be yourself. I mean, and be true to yourself. Uh, yeah. yeah. I am what I am. It's, uh, <laughs> And, and what is what 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 is am? What what are you? I don't know. I, at one school I was at recently, the, there was a little group that I was allowed to talk to after I'd addressed the, the school. Uh, and these were people with, with particular problems, it thought. And, and opposite me, the, the, there was a, a, a tough little uh, 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 boy called Finn, who six months before had been a tough little girl called Finn. Hello, Finn, lovely. Then there was George here. He was about 15. And he, he said, um, what do you do if, if, if your daddy is, is, is gay and then uh, your mummy tells you this morning that, that she is too? I said, it'll be all right, George. It'll, <laughs> it'll, <laughs> it'll sort itself out. But he'd said that, he'd come out with his problem and the teacher said, Terrific, well done, we'll talk about that whenever you want. And then here, there were three gals. It wasn't a school that had uniform. They would look sensational, these girls. They looked as if they were just going out for the night, but it, it was mid-morning. And, and one of them said, look, I'm talking with these, uh, these two here. Uh, uh, we're bi. I said, terrific. 
Well, she said, look, if we're having an affair uh, with a boy at the moment, well, presumably we're straight, are we? And then if we have a girlfriend, well, presumably we're, 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 we're lesbian. I mean, we're fed up with these labels. And I saw the light went on. I thought, well, that's the future. No labels, no flags. I am what I am. And, and if we could just get that into, that into our heads, that we accept uh, someone, regardless of what they look like or where they were born or what their accent is or what their sexuality might be or is going to be, uh, then what an interesting world the place will be. Variety is the spice of life. The idea that we're all the same is so dull. Totally. And of course we're not. And if I could see your faces now, we wouldn't be able to find two people who looked alike. Unless they were identical twins. Unless they were twins. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, no offence to twins. Uh, no, no, we like twins. Ian, Ian, I want to move on. I, I want to, because we've got a lot I want to talk to you about. Drugs. A lot of people are worrying about drug use, chemsex, that it's, it's gone too far. People are killing themselves. They don't understand the dangers they're in. Give us, reflect, because you were around in the, the 1960s. That was an era of, of uh, uh, widespread drug taking. Well, what's your view? <laughs> On chemsex? Well, chemsex, <laughs> I, I, I was, yes. Well, I had my first joint when I was 30. So I wasn't part of the 60s at all. No. They were much, much weaker then, though, weren't they? I mean, they were... Oh, the drugs. The drugs were much... But well, you obviously know a lot more about it than I do. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, well, look, I don't, look after your health, number one. Uh, if yeah. you, I'm surprised that anyone uh, of student age w would need the... Uh, extra thrill of, of, of drugs to make the sex satisfactory. Uh, I think that was more for people of my age. Really, who <laughs> Let's talk about your age, because one of the things... <laughs> no, no, no. One of the things for which I think you were such an inspiration, and for which there are so few role models, is someone gay growing old gracefully. Oh, yes. I mean, Firstly, we lost so many people in the 1980s. There was the wiping out of a cohort of people who might have been growing old. But secondly, there weren't out gays no. until your, 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 your generation. So you're, you're pioneering a path, and I would say a rather good one. I, I, I look up to the way you're doing it. How do you feel about growing Old, apart from the fact you keep yourself very busy, you do a lot. Well, I just get on with my life. I, 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 I'm single, but actually uh, there are other people living in the house. It's a sort of a bit of a... Commune. Yes, <laughs> and, 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 but it's not a gay commune, actually. Um, well, one bisexual, one guy who doesn't realise he's gay, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're all men at the moment. Um, no, I, I, I feel I, uh, the, I just wish that when I was younger, I, I could have been myself, because yeah. I would be different now. What uh, but, you know, uh, you just, without mentioning, touched on AIDS there. I mean, <clears throat> that um, virus which killed so many friends, um, without it, there would not have been the great surge of... of um, success that, that gay people had in defending it, themselves. It created the identity. Because uh, the government, the, the Thatcher government, the, 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 that tried to put us down with Section 28 and, and, and keep, us, keep kids um, ignorant uh, that they might be gay, that, that they, they had gay friends and, and the world was uh, partly gay outside. Um, that government sent round a pamphlet to every household in the country warning them about the dangers of unprotected sex. Now, they didn't approve of unprotected sex, but they had to tell us about it because it was, a, it was a, a, a an important that. national health issue. And that's the time when the newspapers began to talk about the idea that two men or two women together uh, could be very happy that, that having sex. That was when the silence had and, and, to end, mm. basically. So out of that dreadful, dreadful... Um, uh, virus, 
uh, came uh, the hope and the change which we now have. When did you get your first tattoo? <laughs> have you ever seen it? I've not. I've not. Come on. I think you should show it. Come on. Is it there? It is there. Yeah, no, it's there. It's very tiny, Evan. Um, now, I've shown you mine. What about yours? <laughs> <laughs> I've got all these cables and I know you thing. have. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get my tattoo, uh, though. Yeah, I... <laughs> you, 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 talking of growing old, you took a... You, you, when we had our tattoos, all the fellowship in Lord of the Rings went down to a, a, a Maori a tattoo uh, artist uh, one Sunday afternoon in Wellington. And uh, I held Elijah's hand while he had his done. <laughs> <laughs> and we all had them done in different places on our body. I want to ask you this. <laughs> Mine's there. Uh, um, Elijah had his just there. Uh, Orlando, you're interested, aren't you? <laughs> Down here somewhere. <laughs> You, you've, um, in your more recent days, one of your later products, your later outputs, has been a, a sitcom on ITV. Oh, yeah. Vicious. Vicious. With Derek Jacobi. Have any of you seen Vicious? I actually really liked Vicious. I know it was a Marmite product. I think a lot of people didn't think it was your finest They didn't finest get the work. joke. They didn't think it was as good as King Lear or some of the other no. things you'd done. I actually did like Vicious. Um, but it depicted kind of a very bitchy gay world, so yeah. two very, very bitchy gays. Just firstly, you're not that, are you? <laughs> it's the, the no. Um, uh, Vicious was written by an American, and it was modeled on the, 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 on, on the uh, formula of, 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 of the sitcom, the recurring jokes, the, yeah. the caricatures in life, and, and, and his caricature was that uh, two uh, old gay men living together were absolutely horrible to each other in order to survive. That was the joke. Yeah. Um, I, w I, I thought we were going to make a, a, a sitcom about what it was like to be in the real world, uh, and th th this, this was sitcom world we were in. Uh, and anyway, our writer didn't know, didn't know um, the recent history of gay people uh, here, so. But I, I, I liked uh, Freddie and uh, whatever my character was called. Or was I called Freddie? I think I can't I, remember. One of them was Freddie. But but what, I suppose. But for they, me, because they were survivors. Yeah. But for me, I think you want to be a survivor without being bitchy, don't you? You want to. It's about somehow maintaining a certain positivity about the world. Yeah. And it was funny because they, they didn't. But actually. We should. Well, they survived, uh, uh, and, and, and they were fearless, uh, and they were proud. That's not bad, is it? I mean, they, yeah, they wouldn't. They were, you, you, you warmed to them. Look, we haven't got much time, and I, I, I want to go to recent events. So, the last year, year and a half, Me Too has exploded. Allegations all over the place about all sorts of people. Your world, probably, film theatre more affected than any other scene. It must be pretty depressing when you pick up your newspaper and you see people you've worked with, Brian Singer or whoever, Kevin Spacey, you see the names of people being fingered or allegations swirling around. Now, I, I just wonder what your reaction is as you see this unleashed on the world in the last 18 months. Well, frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for someone to accuse me of something and me wondering whether they're not telling the truth and me having forgotten, I, you know. But with, with the couple of the names you mentioned of people I've worked with, uh, both of them were in the closet. And I think hence all their problems as people uh, and, and their relationship with, uh, with other people. And if they had been able to be open about themselves and their desires, uh, they wouldn't have got into the they, they wouldn't have started abusing people in, in the way they're being accused. We have to... Whether they, 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 should, they, whether don't, they, they don't accept that they have, but, but, no, but, but that, that right. goes without But where, where, whether they should be uh, f forced to stop working, well, that's debatable, isn't it? I think that's rather up to the public. Do you want to see someone who's been accused of something uh, that you don't approve of? Uh, do you ever want to see them again? If the answer is no, you won't buy a ticket. You won't turn on the television. 
uh, but there may be others uh, for whom that's um, uh, not a consideration. And um, it, it's difficult to be absolutely black and white. Yeah. Did you know Harvey Weinstein? Did you work? I didn't know Harvey no. Weinstein, no. The other thing is, as we sit here today, Ian, we are <laughs> sitting in a city in a country that is in the midst of the most extraordinary crisis and about what the hell it is doing. And I, I mean, I, in a way, I'm 56, right? He's 79. I can't remember anything like this. You're in your teens or early 20s, and you, you might think this is normal, but it really isn't normal at all. This is extraordinary. What are you making of where the hell we are? When we had the vote way, way back, should we join the common market, uh, I voted against it. Did I, you? I, I Did didn't you? like the idea that um, uh, this somehow... This is 75, 1975. Yes, I, I didn't like the idea that, uh, that big commerce was going to take over the world, and I thought we'd be better being on our own. When it came to the more recent uh, referendum, I voted to remain, because in the meantime, I, um, I, I, I know that... Uh, European institutions, not necessarily part of the EU, but related to the idea that Europe as a conglomerate might have a message uh, and an attitude that was, could affect all our lives positively, uh, that we may be, might be withdrawing from that. Uh, I, I'm a little bit frightened of what we might be withdrawing to. The old days? Uh, are, are we absolutely secure in this country that we will be all right on our own? Uh, if it hadn't been for the European Court for Human Rights, gay people still wouldn't be able to serve in the armed forces if they wanted to. Point of fact, we're not leaving the Court of Human Rights. No, I know. No, 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 no. no, 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 no I just, I just, I just. Um, but there are attitudes here, surely, yeah. would think that and, we don't want those and lots of people alien to, laws. Yeah, 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 and yeah. they're not alien, mm. is my point. Mm. Mm. Are you worried about where the country is then? I mean, you're, you're concerned about this. Because this week could be Theresa May runs out of road, meets the day of destiny, we'll either vote for a deal or we'll vote to delay. I mean, it, the party system is, could be breaking up. I mean, There are you There exhilarated by what's going Theresa on? Theresa May, Theresa May be, Theresa May be not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one simple attitude. I think our politicians have let us down dreadfully. Uh, Is that the mood of the meeting, just out of interest? Politicians let us down, yes or no? Yeah. Um, I don't know where this is going. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm no, lost. No, no. Um, Are you looking for a I, kind of... I, I, I want us to look towards Europe, and maybe Brexiteers do too, I don't know really, but um, we are Europe, our, our culture uh, is European, or, or culture that I care about is, and uh, the idea that we, we can all be on our own is, is, is ridiculous. Uh, but the I don't know, I, oh yes, I know what I was going to say, that, that being nearly 80, it's not my concern, you know? When, when, when this country really goes to the dogs in 10 years' time, uh, I'll be on, under the ground. <laughs> we hope not. So you have to worry about it. Uh, it, it and and, and I, th I think the, the idea that, that people who were uh, too young to vote at the last referendum might swing uh, the decision uh, if, if there were to be a, a people's vote is, is, ve is very potent because uh, it, it it, it's the future. Uh, a wonderful old actor, Alistair Sim, a Scottish comedian. Uh, you should look up his movies. You know who Alistair Sim was. Uh, he, he, he was rather r r uh, radical, and uh, he said he thought people should get the vote at 14 and lose it at, <laughs> at 30. <laughs> well, can you imagine a world in which decisions were ma basic decisions were made? by people under 30. Pluses and minuses, I think, Ian. Yeah, pluses and minuses. I want to end where we started on coming out. There was a line from the third um, of the Lord of the Rings films. Um, Tolkien, I think, had given it to Gandalf. So you had to say it. The grey rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass. 
Can you finish the line? No. <laughs> there was I thinking you'd... And then you see it, while shores and beyond, a far green country under a swift sunrise. Ah, oh, that sounds nice. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think I said that in the film, didn't I? <laughs> I don't know how I ever got this part, because I'd never read Lord of the Rings. <laughs> And of course, the minute I'd accepted the part, people kept coming up to me, relatives, friends, and total strangers telling me that they had. And a few of them would say rather reverentially, I read Lord of the Rings every year. <laughs> and, and on the first uh, week of the millennium, when I arrived uh, to start filming in um, uh, Wellington in New Zealand, uh, Peter Jackson, the director, gave us a, a, a nice welcoming meal. And uh, uh, that's where I met the four adorable hobbits and uh, the three glamorous ones, uh, Aragorn, Boromir, and Legolas. Uh, <laughs> and and, 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 and a, ri a rival wizard, uh, Saruman, uh, Christopher Frank Carandini Lee, who, who'd been in 200 films, in 10 of which he'd played Dracula. Uh, and and over, over the meal, uh, he turned to me, those wonderful, bulging, lustrous eyes, and he confided, I read Lord of the Rings every year. And I thought, oh, thank you. <laughs> then the killer, I've always thought I should play Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, non-binary, all of you, <laughs> we have been privileged this afternoon to listen to the reflections, thoughts, and history of the great Ian McKellen. Can we thank him? Oh. Thank you. Evan Davis and Ian McKellen. Thank you so much. Goodbye.